today will speak about the Eightfold Path. When we have met up with a new life, then we must follow this new path. Or we can also say that we follow this new path, this new way of life, in order to realize a new life. So this noble path, this noble eightfold path, is a new way appropriate to a new life. In Pali, there's the word Arya, the Aryamak, the noble path. We translate Arya to mean noble. What it means is free from dukkha. Arya means free from dukkha. This is what we mean by noble. Literally, it means to, to go away from enemies. By enemies, we mean the defilements of mind, which, which bother us and lead to all sorts of problems. So we call this the noble path because with it, one walks away from enemies. One walks the way that is free of dukkha. This is what we mean by noble. Now let's look at the word eightfold, the noble eightfold path. When we say eightfold, we mean there are eight aspects, links, or components to the one path. It is one single path, not eight separate paths going off in different directions. There is just one path where these eight factors or components are working together, mutually supportive. We can compare this to a rope, a rope that is made of eight strands. The strands are woven together in order to make one single rope. This is much stronger than when the eight strands are left alone to fray and go off in different directions. So eightfold path, one path with eight components or aspects. A very important word to consider is middle. We can call the Noble Eightfold Path the middle path or the middle way. This is very important. What this means is to walk this path correctly, to walk down the middle, correct and proper according to reality or to true nature. Not to be pulled off into, pulled off this way or pulled off that way, but to stay correct walking down this path. The mind follows this balanced middle way according to its true original nature, which is pure. When the mind deviates from its true original nature, it leaves this path. But by following the middle way, the mind follows its true, pure nature. And it does this naturally. This is what we mean by the middle path another way of saying the Noble Eightfold Path. So the word middle practice or 
balanced practice is very important. This means that the clear or the bright mind, which is the true nature of the mind, is of the nature to practice in this middle way, to practice according to reality, according to nature. But when the defilements cover the mind or possess it, then there is deviation into off onto some side track instead of just allowing the bright mind to automatically follow the middle way or the Noble Eightfold Path. When the bright mind is allowed to just go its way, it will automatically follow the middle way, the balanced, correct way. But when the mental defilements come in and cover the mind, then there is a curving off, a straying off of the path. If we look at this from the point of view of modern science, we can say that when the, the baser instincts take over, then the mind is routed into these lower states of mind and is no longer able to follow the middle way. When there is freedom from the defilement, from mental pollution, then the mind goes according to natural knowledge, which is correct and proper. So the bright mind, following this natural knowledge, has no problem following the way. This is its nature. But when the defilements come in, the gilesa, and they, these take over, then things are no longer in balance. The bright mind is balanced, but the defiled mind is imbalanced. And because it is out of balance like this, sometimes it goes off to the left, sometimes to the right. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes down. Or there's too much or too little. This is what happens with the defilement. The natural, pure balance of the mind is interfered with. So, this shows the importance of getting out from under the influence of the gilesa, to long, no longer be under the power of the gilesa the defilement, in order to, to live and walk in this balanced middle way. Let's repeat once again about the instincts. When the instincts are out of control, when there is, we are no longer able to control the instincts, then they become selfish. The out of control instincts become selfish. And this gives rise to all the gilesa. The out of control instincts pull the mind off of the balanced middle way into these dead ends of the gilesa, of the mental defilement. This is very important to note. We often call these things the defilement, but we can see that they are just instincts 
which are out of control. Seeing this gives us an insight into how to bring them under control so they are, that the instincts no longer become gilesa. This is something to be very interested in in order to get back on the path to return to the balanced, bright state of mind in order to follow the path. To make it easier to understand the middle way, let's look at some pairs of things which take us off the middle way. The first pair are extremes of the left and the right. The first extreme off on the left is to go too much according to one's own wishes and desires. This is the extreme of lust or desire, of sensuality, and the indulgence of sensuality. It's indulging in things that cause, that lead to pleasure. Always trying to satisfy pleasures. This is the one extreme. The other extreme off on the right is the opposite of this. It is extreme dislike, hating, aversion to things. We can hate ourselves, deliberately inflict pain, discomfort, and difficulties upon ourselves. Or we attach, we hate or dislike lust, and attaching to this hate of lust, we can deliberately try to damage the sensual organ, the organs of sensuality, in the vain hope that lust will be destroyed this way. These are kinds of attachment off on the right, based on disliking, hating, aversion to things deliberately inflicting pain, discomfort on oneself. So these are these, the first pair of extremes. Indulgence in pleasure and indulgence in affliction and pain or, or self-torment. The next pair is very similar to the first. It's basically a metaphor to describe them. The one extreme is to be soaking wet, to be damp, moist, to be drowning in sensuality, in sense pleasures, greed, and lust. This is to be sinking in the ocean of desire, to be all wet. The other extreme is to be burning, roasting, until one is very, very dry and then begins to burn. This is the other extreme. There are the extremes of being soaking wet on one hand and on the other burning burning up. The first is called, the first one is Akalaha Patipata, and the second is Nichama Patipata. There you go. The third pair of extremes is to take some things as positive and others is negative. The positive are things we're satisfied with. We take satisfaction in these things and judge them as positive. Then other things which we are dissatisfied with, which cause dissatisfaction, 
these are judged to be negative. These are two kinds of attachment. Attaching to things is positive and attaching to things is negative. This means that the mind stupidly goes off in one direction and clings to something as positive or stupidly bends off into another direction and clings to something else as negative. Positive and negative are not the middle way. Their attachment to extremes. So we need to understand this third pair of opposites, of extremes, which are not the balanced middle way. If we look at the world these days, we'll see that practically everybody has gone off into the positive, has gotten off track onto positive things, into satisfaction. So this is a kind of slavery to the positive which causes problems. It also leads to hatred of the negative which causes other problems. To be a slave to the problem, to the positive, gives rise to certain problems and that being a slave to the negative gives rise to other problems. The way has to be found to get out of these kinds of slavery and be free of both the negative and positive in order for the mind to be in the middle, balanced. Fourth pair is to go off and look at the world as, oh, everything's good, everything's wonderful. This is the extreme of optimism. Its opposite is to look at everything as horrible and terrible. The world stinks. This is the extreme of pessimism. Neither of these are the balanced middle way. When the mind loses its balance, when the natural balance of mindfulness and wisdom has been lost, misplaced, forgotten, then the mind sidetracks into positivism and negativism. Um, pessimism and optimism. Going off into optimism is attachment of one kind. And going off into pessimism is attachment of another kind. Neither of these are correct. The mind becomes a slave to the optimism or pessimism, to these kinds of attachment. The mind is no longer free at peace or balance. These extremes, these attachments of optimism and pessimism are misunderstandings or they are types of insanity, of craziness. The craziness of thinking everything's wonderful and the craziness of thinking everything is terrible. Neither of these are the middle way, neither are correct, and neither allow one to live in accordance with reality, to live naturally according to the law of nature. These things pull one off, pull the mind off into problems, confusion, attachment, and insanity. When, in doing this, we no longer see things as they really are. We don't see the world as, in type, Chen Nan Eng, which 
translate something like only this or just as it is isness suchness just the way things are what is what when the mind is balanced it sees the isness the the what is what of everything but when the mind is attaching off into some craziness of pessimism or optimism then this isness cannot be seen now let's look at what it means to be balanced in the middle in the middle there is the realization that everything is just changing flowing according to the law of itapa jayata itapa jayata means that this being that becomes this being that becomes this being that becomes it's the eternal process of cause and effect and effect being the further cause of of other effects so this being that becomes this being that becomes this is what's going on in the middle this is also the we can see this as the process of paticca samuppada or dependent origination which you've heard something about this is what's going on in the middle this this process of change following the law of cause and effect this is the law of nature when the mind is pulled off into extremes it isn't able to see or understand this law of nature this law of itapa jayata but when it is when we come back to the middle and there is balance things reality nature life is understood as flowing processing according to the law of this is that becomes this is that becomes this is that becomes this is that becomes to be at the center is to see that there is nothing outside of this law of itapa jayata it is to make no distinction between anything So let's revise my translation a bit. I said this is that becomes. This isn't quite right. When everything is seen as according to the law of itapa jayata, then there is no longer this and that. There is only this. This is this becomes. This is this becomes. There is no when this is understood fully there is no distinction between this and something else everything is just this this is this becomes this is this becomes this is this becomes there is no longer the division and separation of self and others of me and them of us and they these dis- these distinctions no longer have any appearance of validity because everything is seen as the law of itapa jayata this is this becomes this is this becomes this is this becomes and that's all and so without these separations divisions distinctions then there can be no extreme such as pessimism and optimism or positivism and negativism because there is just this middle this balance of the law of itapa jayata this is this become now let's look at 
the pairs of opposites. As we all know, there are many of these. We've been talking, we've mentioned a few, such as pessimism or optimism and pessimism. Now let's look at these pairs of opposites. The first one is good and evil. Good and evil are, once again, when the mind has gotten out of balance and is no longer in the middle. It's taking sides and making preferences. When something pleases us or goes the way we want it to go, then we judge it as good. It is evaluated as good in an unbalanced, selfish way. When something doesn't please us, when it doesn't go the way we want, that is judged to be evil. Neither of these are balanced in the center because they aren't seeing things as they really are, as just the process of itapajayata. Out of the middle, we no longer see this process and then are evaluating things as good and evil in a selfish, egocentric way. This is the first pair, good and evil. The first pair of opposites which illustrate the lack of balance. To be balanced, the most proper way to phrase this is to say that the mind is free or above the meaning of good and evil. When good and evil have no value to the mind. This is an exact way of stating it. If you understand what we were saying about this first pair of opposites, then you will understand what is written in the Christian Bible on the first page of Genesis. There is the, the account where God forbid Adam, Adam to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam to leave that fruit alone. He says, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the good and now of the the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you will die. You understand what we're talking about in this first pair of opposites. You'll understand what is meant here. Attachment to good and attachment to evil is death. The common person sees everything as they appear to him. Everything is judged according to dualism. All these pairs of opposites are believed to really exist as far as the mind of the common person goes. But this isn't the truth. This common appearance, these views of the common mind are not true or real. When we follow this appearances of dualism, this leads to attachment to good and attachment to evil, and this is death. This is what is meant in the first, the first book of Genesis, the first chapter. The second, the second pair of opposites which we'll look at is sukha and dukkha, or happiness and unhappiness. Unhappiness is when there is something that pleases, and unhappiness is when there is something that displeases. 
once again, there is selfish judging. Now, happiness leads to various problems. To getting tired chasing after happiness, the frustration of not getting more happiness, the, the fear that the happiness will go away, and many other problems like this. So happiness itself is not free of problems. Unhappiness, we have no doubts about. It's always leading to problems, so we don't have to give you any examples. Both of these extremes, both of these kinds of attachment to what pleases and what displeases, cause us all sorts of problems and difficulties. Mm -hmm. They tire us out, they frustrate us, they confuse us. Neither of these are that balanced middle way. So we have to learn about these attachments, or we ought to learn about these attachments to what pleases and displeases, to happiness and un unhappiness, which are just deceptions and illusions which cause the mind or which encourage the mind to leave the place of balance where things are understood as only processing according to Itapajayada. When there is this, this arises. When there is this, this arises. This is, this arises. This is, this becomes. This is the middle, the balance of the realization of the process of Itapajayada. The next pair to look at is getting and losing, or profit and loss. Where something happens and is judged to be to our advantage, to our benefit. Something else that happens is judged to be to our disadvantage. One we take as a profit, the other as a loss. Now these are other kinds of attachment because we don't see things as just itapajayata or the law or process of itapajayata which explains everything that happens. But when we start thinking in terms of profit and loss and attaching to these terms then the mind is falling into deception. Winning and losing. Everybody's attached to winning, and nobody likes to lose. This creates all sorts of problems, because there is no realization or understanding of Itapa Jayada. This is, this arises. This is, this arises. There is this, this becomes. A further pair is male and female. This is another kind of attachment. Instead of just seeing things as itapajayata, this is, this becomes, judging things as male and female, making these distinctions and separations, and then attaching to them, attaching to things as male, attaching to things as female. And we're all aware of the many problems that arise because of these attachments to what, to some things as being male and others as being female. A great many problems arise through these attachments. These attachments only happen because of deception, illusion. The ignorant, not under, non-understanding, not knowing of Itapajayata, which is the, the middle balanced truth or reality. This is, this becomes. This is, this becomes. See how this attachment to opposites works or how it arises. Let's look at time. Now we divide time up into day and night. 
And after we've made this, uh, this vision, we had, after we have this attachment, we see day and night as op opposite things. This is just our own stupidity in not seeing things as they really are. We think that day and night are completely different things. But all it is, is the change of this thing we call time. It's just change, according to Itapajaya Da. That's all. In the daytime, there is change. And in what we call night, there is change. It's just this thing we call time, changing and changing. This is, this becomes, this is, this becomes. In what we call day, there are these changes where there happens to be more sunlight. And then these changes continue. There happens to be more and more moonlight. But in this process of change, there is, there is no real thing that we can attach to as day or as night. It's only our misunderstanding which causes us to fall into this deception. So what we need to see are the, the qualities or the benefits or virtues of things which lead us into deception, which cause us to be deceived. Take male and female again. There are certain things about certain female things and certain male things which we attach to. And through this attachment, we make this separation of male and female, where there is no real distinction. Instead of just seeing the process of change, which leads to certain things we call female and certain things we call male, which keep changing, are never any solid, static thing. These, these things that we, that deceive us, lead us into attaching to maleness, femaleness. And this distinction takes us out of balance. It's through not seeing, by being deceived and not realizing the law of Vipapajaya Da, that these things happen. It's very important to find and notice the, these causes of our deception. We hold that Vipapajaya Da is Buddhism itself. The Blessed One, the Lord Buddha said that he who sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha. He who sees the Buddha sees the Dhamma. The Blessed One also said that he who sees or the one who sees Itapajaya Da sees the Dhamma. The one who realizes the Dhamma realizes Itapajaya Da. The one who realizes Itapajaya Da sees the Buddha. Not the physical body of the Buddha, but the real, true, genuine Buddha, the one who knows the one, the awakened one. This is why Itapajaya Da is the heart of Buddhism. It's the Dhamma, the truth, the way things are. To see and realize this is to follow and practice the middle way. I'd like all of you to become familiar with this word, Itapajaya Da. Think about it, repeat it, get to know it, 
so that it is no longer a strange, unfamiliar word. Bring it into your everyday vocabulary so that it is an everyday word for you. Itapajayata. Get very familiar with this word. This is because this is the heart of Buddhism. To see and realize, to be familiar with Itapajayata is necessary to continue the study and practice of Buddhism. In Anapanasati, in each of the 16 steps, there is, there is non-attachment. When there is realization of Itapajayata, then there is no attachment to any extreme or to any of the pairs of opposites. So through in Anapanasati, there is the realization and practice of Itapajayata. Because in each step, each of the 16 steps are leading to non-attachment. In none of the 16 steps is there attachment to any of the pairs of opposites. So Itapajayata is central to the practice of Anapanasati and to the further study and practice of Buddhism. So please be very familiar with Itapajayada. Repeat it to yourself until it is no longer a strange word. Bring it into your everyday usage. We'd like to encourage you, in fact we insist, that you practice saying this word. Get the sound right. Memorize it and practice saying it over and over so that you know it well. And whenever the time comes to use this word, it will roll right off your tongue easily and naturally. So just It's a long word, so practice saying it so that you've got it right. And then whenever you have the opportunity to use it, you can use it freely and easily in everyday conversation. It's the kind of word that is appropriate throughout the day. So let's practice saying it. Itapajayata. And if we use the correct full Pali name, then we add Paticca Samupato. Itapajayata Paticca Samupato. Itapajayata or Paticca Samupato. Itapajayata Paticca Samupato. You can use that, or you can use just Itapajayata, or just Paticca Samupato. Just keep practicing and repeating until you've got them down, and then use them in your normal conversation, which will be beginning again the day after tomorrow. So you can practice these to yourself today and tomorrow, and then after that you can practice using them in conversation. In summary, the realization, the experience, and full understanding of Itapajayata Paticca Samupato will protect the mind. It will maintain it in the middle. Itapajayata, the realization of Itapajayata, keeps the mind balanced and protected so that nothing can pull it out of balance. Nothing can pull the mind out of the center. This experience of Itapajayata makes it impossible for any of the instincts to yank the mind off the middle way. This realization of Itapajayata Patika Samupato makes it impossible for any of the defilements the gilesa, to pull the mind out of balance. None of the pair of opposites can knock the mind off balance when it is realizing itapajayata. So this law of itapajayata, the realization of it, 
keeps the mind on the middle way. It prevents attachment and all the problems that lead from attachment. It keeps the mind centered and balanced on the middle way. So let's go back and talk about the Eightfold Path some more. When, when there is perception or realization of Itapajayata, then it is very easy to follow the Noble Eightfold Path. When we are following the Noble Eightfold Path, it is not difficult to realize Itapajayata. So let's come back and look at the Noble Eightfold Path. Now, make sure that you understand that the Eightfold Path is one single path, one single way. Now, we can, we can see that it has, th we can look at it in three aspects. The first aspect is the walking or progress of the spirit of sati vanya, mindfulness, wisdom. The second is the, the walking or progress of the body. And the third aspect is the walking or progress of the mind. So it's one path. We can look at it through these three aspects. The first aspect is spiritual, the second is body, and the third is mental. The first of these three aspects, that of Satipanya, mindfulness wisdom, has two of the eight links in the Noble Eightfold Path. The first of these two links is Samatiti, or right view or right understanding. Right view and right understanding is the understanding of dukkha, the understanding of the cause of dukkha, the understanding of the utter extinction of dukkha and the understanding of the path which leads to the utter extinction of dukkha. So right view has these four views. These four views, the understanding of the Four Noble Truths makes up this first link of the Noble Eightfold Path, Sama Titi. If we look at Samatiti, right view, as a belief, it leads one down the middle way. It keeps one from going off into the extreme. By doing this, right view leads one away from or out of dukkha. So this correct understanding leads us along the middle way and leads us to avoid dukkha, which in turn will develop the understanding of the Four Noble Truths further. And so the belief gains more confidence through this experience of following the middle path and being free of dukkha. So this is the importance of the first of these eight things, samatiti. Samatiti includes the understanding of the truth of all nature. You see the reality of all natural things. 
This is meant by samatiti, means the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. It means the right understanding of anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and non-soul. This is also included in samatiti. <clears throat> Further, it includes the correct understanding of itapajayata and of paticca samupato. All these are the proper and right understanding of nature and of all natural phenomena. And this is what is meant by right understanding. Sama Siti. We can enumerate all kinds of different types of knowledge, which are the true knowledge of things. But we can summarize all of these if they are correct knowledge. The summary of all correct knowledge is dukkha and the extinction of dukkha. This is the true understanding of everything, dukkha and the end of dukkha. This is the summary of sama siti. The second factor of this first aspect of the path is sama sankapa. This is right intention, right objective, right aspiration, sometimes translated right thought. It's the intention. There are three kinds of intention which are meant by sama sankapa. The first is the intention to be free of greed and sensuality. The second right intention is to be free of, of ill will, of ill intention. And the third right intention or right aspiration is free of harming. <clears throat> so these are the three kinds of right aspiration, sama, sankapa. Freedom from sensuality and greed, freedom from ill will, and freedom from harming or violence. Sama Sankapa is the fruit or result of Sama Titi. When there is understanding of Dukkha in the end of Dukkha, then there arises the intention, the right aspiration to act in a way that does not cause Dukkha, to act for the end of Dukkha, the extinction of Dukkha. For this reason, then, there is the intention to act in non-sensual ways, to act in non-harmful ways, and to act free of ill will or anger. These three are the results, these intentions are the results of right view. So samatiti and samasankapa are the first aspect of the path. The second aspect has three factors. This is the aspect that is of the body, the bodily path, the bodily aspect of the path. These three factors are samawaja, right speech, sama kamanto, right bodily action, and sama achiwo, right livelihood. Now these three are quite simple and you should all understand them. They're nothing difficult to comprehend and so we don't have to go in, into detail. Right speech is to speak in a way 
that does no ill or harm to anyone but and only has benefits. Right bodily action has no harm, does no harm or violence to anyone but only has benefits. And right livelihood harm does not harm, exploit or do violence in any way but is only beneficial. These are Samawatka, right speech, Samagamanto, right bodily action, and Sama Achiwo, right livelihood. Most of you are practicing these already, so you should understand them quite easily. Now the next aspect is that which is particularly of the mind. There are three factors in this mental aspect of the past. The first of these is Sama Vayama. Vayama means effort. It means to dare, to, to have the courage to practice. It's to be certain and sure in that practice to keep moving forward, to never retreat, never give up. This is right effort. This is effort. Now right effort must be correct, must be right daring and right certainty, <clears throat> always moving forward in a correct way so that there are no disadvantages for anyone and only benefits. For to be correct, right effort will do no harm, but will only, only benefit. Another way to see right effort is in four ways. First of these is to prevent the arising of undesirable things, of unwholesome things. Don't allow them to arise. The second is to abandon these unprofitable, undesirable things that have arisen. <clears throat> then there are useful, desirable, profitable things. The ones that have not arisen need to be developed. The ones that have already have arisen should be maintained. So there are these four aspects of right effort, to avoid or abandon unprofitable, unwholesome, undesirable things and states, and then to develop and maintain the profitable, wholesome, desirable states. These four make up Sama Vayama, right effort. The next factor is sama sati, right sati, right mindfulness. Now the correct, when we are practicing anapanasati, if we are doing so correctly, then we are practicing correct mindfulness. There is mindfulness of the in-breath, mindfulness of the out-breath. Then we are practicing and developing right mindfulness. Right mindfulness is to be always mindful. Mindful before thinking. Mindful before speaking. Mindful before acting. This is right mindfulness. Through the four foundations of mindfulness we develop samasati so that whatever the situation, event, or occurrence, whatever sensual objects make contact with the, ear, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, in all of these events or occurrences, with mindfulness, 
we can struggle, cope and with and solve whatever the situation is. This is right mindfulness. We develop it and practice it by being mindful of every in-breath and every out-breath through the 16 steps of Anapanasati. The four foundations of mindfulness is the development of right is the development of right mindfulness. And anapanasati is the correct way of, do, of doing this, of developing and practicing sama sati. The last factor is sama samati. This is when all the energy and power of the mind is gathered together. This is Sama Samati. The mind's energies are all gathered together and united. The Gilesa, the defilements, and the Nivarana hindrances are not present. The mind is extremely powerful because all of its energies have been gathered together. When the mind is like this, gathers all these energies and focuses them on one thing, on the extinction of dukkha. When there is this sama samadhi, the mind is extremely active as it focuses it on this one duty, this one function or activity, the extinction of dukkha. The mind is completely active regarding this function, the extinction of dukkha. The mind is also pure, and it is completely steady. So sama samadhi, when the mind's energies are gathered together and focused on the single goal of deliverance, of nibbana, of freedom from dukkha, then the mind is active regarding this, this duty, this function. It is pure and it is steady. This is sama Samati. In the practice of Anapanasati, the complete and successful practice of the first four steps or the first tetrad <coughs> has the result of Sama Samati. Through completely practicing these four steps, through the calming of the breath, the calming of the body, and the calming of the mind, sama samati develops through the practice of the first four steps of anapanasati. This results in the four jhana, or the four absorptions. Sama samati is the first, second, third, and fourth absorption. But the first absorption alone, this is samati. This is the result of successfully practicing the first four steps of anapanasati. This last factor of the path, sama samati, has the function and duty of cutting the defilement has the function and duty of bringing the instinct under control. When all the energy and power of the mind is set on this goal, then it can go along and accomplish it. This is the goal of Sama Samadhi, the cutting of the defilement, the controlling of the instinct, freedom from dukkha. This is the eighth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path.
มะสมาธิ When the strength and power of each of these eight factors is gathered together, this is called the Noble Eightfold Path. Remember, it's like a rope with eight strands. For that rope to be strong, the eight strands must be woven together. In the Noble Eightfold Path, each factor must be correct in fully. Doing its function, it must function properly and correctly. When all eight are functioning properly and correctly together, this is the noble eightfold path. The gathering together of these eight functions and the strength, energy, and power of these eight factors, this is the noble eightfold path. When, when the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path are correct and functioning together, we can change the name. Instead of calling it the Noble Eightfold Path, we can call this Arya Sama Samati with and seven and helpers or supporters. So when all eight factors are working together, functioning to their fullest. In harmony, we can call this noble, right samadhi, with seven helpers or supporters. So we take the eight factors, eight factors, when they're functioning completely and properly, and we see that Arya Sama Samati is the leader, the commander. Of, the, of all eight factors, with the seven factors supporting it, and when this has happened, then Arya Sama Samati, Noble Right Samadhi, is able to cut the defilement, cut the hindrances. It can cut and root up all ignorance. Whatever there is that needs to be cut, Arya Sama Samati can cut it through this. Gathering together of the eight factors through this correctness and power, Arya Sama Samati will mm. cut all the defilements so that the mind is liberated from defilements, from attachment, from self, from soul, from ego, from desire, and from dukkha. This is what happens when the eight factors are developed to their fullest extent, so that Arya Sama Samati can take the lead with the support of the other seven and cut everything that needs to be cut, so that the mind is liberated. <clears throat> Now, one other thing you should know is that these eight factors are the practice. They're the path that is practiced, that we do. These are the eight factors, with Arya Sama Samati as the leader, and the other seven as helpers and supporters. When all eight factors are working together and functioning correctly, under the leadership of Noble Right Samadhi, then there arises. Sama Yana, right knowledge, or right realization. Yana is knowledge or realization. So when the eight factors are working fully, there arises right realization. And together with the arising of right realization arises Sama Vimutti. Right emancipation. So these, the first eight factors are the cause. And then there are these two factors, which are the fruit of the path. These two are right knowledge and right emancipation. They are the fruits of the path. What arises 
when the eight factors are fully developed and brought together in the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. So there are the Noble Eight, and then there are two more rightnesses to make ten. So this Noble Eightfold Path the, and the practice of it, the walking of it, is what is meant by a new life. A new life arises when this Noble Eightfold Path is practiced. It is practiced for Nibbana, for freedom from Dukkha, for the complete extinction of Dukkha. But even, even if this, this progress to Nibbana is not completely realized, the Noble Eightfold Path can be used in the life, in everyone's life, whether one is ordained as a monk or nun or priest, or whether one is living the householder's life. One still can have and live a new life by following the Noble Eightfold Path, which leads to Nibbana. For a new life, one needs to be moving toward Nibbana whether one is ordained or a lay person. This is what is meant by a new life, to be practicing the Noble Eightfold Path that leads to Nibbana. At, on this point, we will end today's talk about the Noble Eightfold Path.